Well, yeah, do you want me to like pray or break things up for you guys so you're not doing everything or if you want to, to you, introduce or pass There's out? two pages, each one, so. Do you want to pass them both out at the same time? Yeah, they, they go together, yep. Hey, lead us in a song. And I'll, uh, lead us in a song. Kill the music there, Patrick. We will seek your face, almighty God. Turn and pray for you to heal our land. Father, let revival start in us. Then every heart will know your kingdom's come. Lifting up the name of the Lord in power and in unity. We will see the nations turn, touching heaven, changing earth. We're lifting up the name of the Lord in power and in unity. We will see the nations turn, touching heaven, changing earth. We're touching heaven, changing earth. Never looking back, we'll run the race. <clears throat> Giving you our lives, we'll gain the prize. We will take the harvest given us. And though we sow in tears, we'll reap in joy. Lifting up the name of the Lord in power and in unity. We will see the nations turn, touching heaven, changing earth. We're lifting up the name of the Lord in power and in unity. We will see the nations turn, touching heaven, changing earth. We're touching heaven, changing earth. Send revival. Send revival. Send revival to us. Send revival. Send revival. Send revival to us. Lifting up the name of the Lord in power and in unity. We will see the nations turn, touching heaven, changing earth. We're lifting up the name of the Lord in power and in unity. We will see the nations turn, touching heaven, changing earth. We're touching heaven, changing earth. We're touching heaven, changing earth. All right, you guys can have a seat. This session, we are again continuing a well-rounded kid, and this section is a well-rounded kid respects authority. In Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 2, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe the land you're crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God. Uh, we live in a culture that doesn't like the idea of fearing any authority figure. And yet one of the foundations of Scripture is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And it is an integral and essential part of wisdom. And so as we talk about these kids that are about to go into this land of blessing, God says, man, you guys, you've got to make sure that you teach them to love me. You've got to make sure that you teach them to respect my authority. And love, respect can flow out of love. But uh, this morning, you know, one of the things I think, or this, I guess it's afternoon now, that you got to remember is teaching your child to fear the Lord 
means teaching them to respect authority. The idea of fear, and some people say, well, it's not really fear, it's, it's, it's more of a reverence. And I would challenge you to look at 40 different translations and see how many of them say fear, because most of them say fear. It is true that there's the idea contained in that word of reverence, but there's also the idea of fear, of this, man, I, I, I don't want to, I'm afraid of, uh, of disappointing him. I'm also afraid of what happens if I don't listen, it happens to me. So teaching your child to fear the Lord means teaching them to respect authority. And the key to your child, to teaching your child to fear the Lord is teaching the child to fear you. Now, we are completely willing on every other one that we'll look at when we'll say, listen, the key to teaching your child to be responsible is for you to be responsible. We go, oh, yes, naturally. The key to teaching your kid to love God is teaching them to love you. And you go, oh, yeah, that's natural. I'm that person that got in the place. The key to teaching your child to fear God is to fear you. And we go, well, I don't want my kid fearing me. And it, I think, I, I've thought about this for years because this has been true now for, since the very first time I've done this lesson. There's always been a little bit of blowback or people at least going, man, that's difficult. And I, I've thought about in process, why do we have problems on the other two, uh, no problem with the other two, but with this we do. And what I think is it, it points to our natural sinful inclination and our natural desire what we want to do. So here's the thing, fearing God is, is, is the foundation, the Bible says, of being able to launch into a life of knowledge and wisdom that's well lived. You're the person that God has taught them to, to fear, uh, for them to fear you. Now the key to teaching your child to fear you is consistent discipline. And both of those words are essential to that formula, consistent discipline. Whenever you look in scripture, there is a reason why people should fear God, right? I remember Patrick Mead one time saw, it was talking about a bumper sticker that he saw, and it said, who would Jesus bomb? And it was an anti-war thing, and Patrick said, well, I don't know all the answer to who he would, but I'm thinking Sada, Gomorrah, and he listed about three places where God, and remember Jesus existed before he was incarnate, Jesus created and destroyed everything that's been destroyed. And so it's one of those things I think that it is super, super important to recognize that God has taught us to be afraid, and he has taught us to be afraid by using discipline in our lives that is never pleasant, the book of Hebrews says, but it is essential to our development. So in this session, we're going to be answering three questions, and if you notice, you've got a page and a half of notes. Uh, we're going to spend more time in this session than in the last one, and, and that was purposely because this is the, one of the ones. If there is any place, I think, that, that people who claim to believe the Bible and even who live surrendered lives in so many areas of their lives will decide that they're going to buck against Scripture and against God, this is the section, I think, that we tend to do that. And we'll talk about a little bit of the reasons why, but first of all, let's answer that first question what does the Bible say about child discipline? And we're just going to look through some things that, that it says and, and kind of give you a paraphrase, and then we'll come back and talk about them. First of all. Uh, readiness to discipline is a mark of love, reluctance to a mark of hate. And that sounds really strong when you say it, but it's <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it, you know, and one of the things, we've, you've heard me say this if you've, been, if you've been in the crossings. We used to do a little Bible trivia in our cross chats. We called them Bible Talks. But we would have this thing, is it there or not? Is this in Scripture? And you'd have them things like, I've been saved by the skin of my teeth. You know, a penny saved is a penny earned. Uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. And almost always when we would do that, they would say, yeah, spare the rod, spoil the child is in there. And that thing about the skin of my teeth, it's not. And they were wrong on those. Job said, I've been saved as if by the skin of my teeth. And the Bible doesn't say, spare the rod, spoil the child. The passage that we, that we, that that sometimes we, we would refer to is in Proverbs 13, 24. Read is going to read that to you. Uh, it's even stronger. It says, whoever refuses to spank his son hates him, but whoever loves his son disciplines him from early on. So here's this idea that if I am hesitant to discipline, then God doesn't look down and go, oh, man, you loved your child so much. He uses a word, and by the way, look that word up in the, in the Hebrew sometime, and what you're going to find out is with all of its nuances, it means to despise, to hate. Now, I know that you all would never say that you hate your child, but in Scripture, loving is not always an emotion. We understand that, don't we? When the Bible talks, sometimes love is a verb. 
And it's why you can have an emotion of love and do things that are destructive to your kid in love. Well, in Scripture, hate isn't always a, an emotion. It's a, it's a way of acting. And so what he's saying is, man, this is a destructive, this is a bad thing when you won't discipline your kid. And I think it's, and we need to look to it when it says from early on, you know, I think a lot of times as parents, we, we, of course, we think our child is the smartest child in the world most of the time, except when it comes to the time to discipline that child. You know, uh, I can remember when Ashley was one year, she's probably one, she just started walking and um, I wasn't the type of parent that would She put, came out of the womb talking, by the <laughs> way. So. She did. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't put things away, you know. I just left everything out, and I taught them, you don't touch that. You know, and now I know it's popular. Parents put everything away, and they don't teach their kids anything. But Ashley and I, when she was around one, had a war early on because she would look at me, no, and I'd say no. And she would, this is one, put her hand out there. And I'd say no. 25 times I counted. I finally won. She broke. 25 times I smacked her little hand and she caught on. It wasn't she was dumb. She, she would look at me and go, <laughs> really calm, very quietly. You know, and I think a lot of times today, you know, as parents, we think, oh, they're too young. They're just too young. You know, they don't understand what they're doing. Yes, they do. They manipulate you. <laughs> just saying. In Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, the Bible says, my son, don't despise the Lord's discipline and don't resent his rebuke. I don't know if you understand how difficult that is. You probably do if you've underwent hardship, if you've underwent things that are unfair. The Hebrew church, it's the same message that he's given to them as guys, do not resent the correction. Don't rebel against his rebuke. But the proverb writer gives us the why when he says, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a son as, as a father, the son he delights in. He goes, don't get all upset and angry. Don't get all, don't bail. Don't think, it, God's not doing this because he has something against you. He's doing this because he delights in you. And the truth is, just the scripture says, a reluctance to discipline is not a mark of love. It's a mark of a much more heinous kind of emotion. Second thing scripture says is that physical discipline won't kill them. It'll help them to live. Don't fail to correct your children. They won't die if you spank them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. Proverbs 23, 13, 14. <clears throat> it has been a long tested and tried trend and, and approach for a kid to make you think you're killing them, mm -hmm. right? You're killing me, I'm killing me. I don't remember where I was. I was in an aisle somewhere and somebody said, he's beating me, he's beating me. And I go around and they're just slapping the hand. I'm going, beating nothing, you know. Later, let me have you. I'll show you what I, <laughs> right, you know. But, but there's this idea that somehow that, you, that, that, you know, physical, corporal kind of uh, punishment is, is going to be destructive. But, but, and we get these visions just like kids use that. That's sort of where we go. So, oh, it's going to. But he says, no, nah, here, it's, it's not going to kill them. It's the, secret to, it's the secret to life. And I think sometimes because maybe we had parents that were out of control, we tend to go the other direction, you know. And so we just say, well, I'm just not going to spank them, you know, because my parent was out of control. But you can be in control. You don't have to do what your parent did if they were out of control. Refusing another thing that the, the Bible says about child discipline, refusing to discipline your child will ruin their life. Mm -hmm. uh, Discipline your son in the early years while there's hope. If you don't, you'll ruin his life. Uh, just this idea, listen, there's a period of time, there is a window of opportunity. And how many of us view child discipline as an opportunity? We view it as a burden. We view it as something that we can't stand. So do our kids. But God says, listen, you have a window of opportunity to direct the rest of their life. And if you don't take advantage of it, it can ruin it can ruin their lives and i'm telling you i can't tell you how many of my friends that i've looked around and growing up with and they didn't have parents who disciplined them i i hung out with with guys that honestly that either their parents were absolutely negligent or they were progressive uh one of my you know some richard and some of those guys their parents were just they would be considered low social economic standing and it's just a, a pattern of, of mis misbehavior and just a, a generational curse they let their kids do whatever and there's richard and herman i can't even remember none of them made it through life well 
I mean, they, they're, I, I haven't saw them for years, but I, I, I have zero doubt. I know that some of them are already divorced. One of them's been in jail. And, and it was this slower social ec- economic thing. I had another friend whose parents were very progressive, you know, and they had, a, they had a lot of money and they had alcohol in their house and the kid could go down if he wanted to and he could drink, a, you know, a part of a beer and they wouldn't freak out or anything. And yet they, they never disciplined him. And he's now a quadriplegic because he dove off a 15-foot platform into 12 inches of water. Uh, you know, there's, there's things that, that, you know, we're, but, the, but again, as you look and see what Scripture says, that it is super important to know that if you are uh, going to bless your kids, you've got to make sure you, you follow what Scripture says. The next one is discipline decides if your child lives wisely or like a fool. Proverbs twenty two fifteen says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of cor- correction will drive it far from him. And again, if you notice in Scripture, there, is a, there, uh, there tends to be a, this, this repeated thing about physical, you know, you've got the rod of correction. And, and we're going to talk about the Scripture is full of other forms of discipline, but it doesn't shy away at all from things that, that we might shy away from. That our culture has put a, a, a bit of a, a you know, a, a negative slant on the Scripture seems to do something completely different. Another thing that the Bible says that about your disciplining your child is discipline leads to a better relationship or better relationships with your child. Better, a better relationship, little typo there. Look at Proverbs 29, 9, 17. Discipline your children and they will give you happiness and peace of mind. Uh, sometimes we think that giving in to them is going to give us happiness and peace of mind. But through the years, again, what I've witnessed over and over and over and over again it's not the abusive parent that has a good relationship. It's not the non-disciplined parent that has a good relationship with their kids. But those who have guided them, who have used discipline as a, as a guardrail to keep their children on a safe path and prevent them from hurting themselves, there's an incredible relationship that they get to share. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's something that I never really saw growing up, but I've got to see since then, and there's been a hallmark of it, is you have somebody who is very loving, and a part of that loving, they were very consistent in their discipline. Uh, the next one is discipline doesn't de- destroy self-esteem. It helps develop it. Proverbs fifteen thirty-two: those who refuse correction hate themselves, but those who accept correction gain understanding. And again, with that passage, you've got to see what the writer of Proverbs is doing is he's, he's correcting. He's using those who, who don't have discipline hate themselves. Those who do have understanding. You see, a lot of times when we have low self-esteem, not based upon anything that's genuinely wrong with us. Now, I'm not saying that you or I are superstars, but I grew up, grew up feeling dumb and feeling ugly and feeling like I didn't fit in. Now, in any of those, car- car- those categories, I was, not go- I was never at the very top of any of those. I wasn't the smartest, I wasn't the best looking, and I wasn't the best socially. But as I look back, it's a, it was a lie that I was believing that allowed me, and in believing it, I hated myself. I am absolutely convinced that one of the problems that contributed to that was an improper balance of discipline. My dad not being there because of the shift he's working on, but heavily a mom who refused to acknowledge the problems that I had and would always defend me. And defending me made me feel incompetent and, and made me feel like, you know, I'm not capable of handling things on my own. And I really did hate myself. And the Bible says that, listen, if you discipline, they gain an understanding. What, what could have happened? I would have known, Robert, sometimes you're out of line. That's why you get in trouble. It's not everybody's against you. You're capable. I would, have, I would have had a better perspective to where there would have been instruction on what was right with wrong with me, what was right with me, but also what was wrong with me, and I would have been able to have wisdom. But if I remove the teaching of discipline, I leave myself ignorant, and you leave your kid ignorant of who they really are. That, yeah, you're capable, and you can do better, and this is a problem. And so, again, one of the things that the, the Bible says about child discipline is it doesn't destroy properly, properly implemented. It doesn't destroy self-esteem. It doesn't destroy the value that they have of themselves, but it leads to increasing it. Uh, number two, why is disciplining my child so difficult for me? The first thing is, it's usually selfishness. Um, And I think a lot of times as parents, we want our kids to love us. And so we think, well, if I discipline them, they're not going to love me. Or we make one or the other be the bad parent who does all the disciplining because we want to be their friend. We want to be loved by them. 
and, and I don't think that we can underestimate him, and this can raise red flags, and you may get angry, but all you have to look is the massive amount of codependency that we have in our culture, this, that, we, that somebody else has to be happy in order for us to be happy, and that's sort of a, a simplification of codependency, but that's really what it's about, that we are so emotionally tied with this person that if they are not well, we're like Siamese parent and child. And so if they are not feeling good about me right now, that bad blood is flowing into me and I'm not feeling good about me. And somebody has got to be the parent and say that, hold it, now, now God didn't always design for you to feel good. Read the Psalms, read about the value of suffering, read about the value of, of difficulty, read about the value of discipline. And sometimes, quite frankly, it's not you, you, when you go, oh, I just, I love my kid, I just can't discipline. No, you love yourself so you can't discipline them. And I know that sounds hard, but with your kids, they're too important for you to live in a land of denial, and you've got to step out of that. If you're not disciplining your child, it is not because they are, they, they, that, that, that you just love them so much. You need to be careful, because if you, you will raise your child to where they love you, but they don't love themselves because they're such a mess. I've watched kids, you know, you, one of the things you, you read about serial killers, and even in the portrayal, and there's some distortion, but, but you'll, you'll notice a lot of times in serial killers, it's true in life and in, in the movies, that there's this parent figure who is there who is always, you know, you know, covering for them. I don't know if anybody watches Gotham. You've got Penguin on there, and you've got this mother figure that sort of exemplifies all that I'm talking about. The problem whenever you're raising a kid just to love you, they may love you and you're doing everything to love them, but they really never have a basis to love themselves. Other kids don't like them. They're the spoiled kid that people don't want to be around. And so all the other voices, the internal voice and the voices of everybody but you, so you're feeling happy in this land of denial, but the kid is feeling this horrible hatred of yourself because... He wasn't, the, what was best for him was not the focus you were. The second reason that we don't discipline as hard is because of faithlessness. We just don't believe God on these things. And I can give you, you know, a half dozen reasons as to why, what is, anytime you don't believe God, it's because another voice is speaking to you. Uh, every act of disobedience is grounded in a lie at some point. And ultimately, the author of all those lies is, is the evil one, is Satan himself. But maybe you grew up in an abusive kind of culture, uh, abu abusive family. And, if, in, and I know through several friends and, and people that I love, their parents were so hard at disciplining and so obnoxious and over-the-top and abusive that they are compensating rather than simply allowing God's word to be trusted, you've come to that point, that voice that says, well, I need to compensate because of the abuse that was here. I need to go over here. And when you swing over here, you go from one ditch to another ditch. And the truth is in the middle of the road. And so, you know, you can have that, that, that voice of the past that's speaking to you. And, and let me encourage you to make sure that if you are from a, an abusive background physically, you need to be careful, but you also need to be careful that you don't trust your instinct more than you trust God. And that you understand there is a role, not just in general, but there is a role in your parenting and in your life for you to be a consistent disciplinarian. And the third reason is just laziness. Um, and I know a lot of times when we have all six grandkids, um, not Kennedy so much anymore, but the younger ones especially, we can be in a car and it's going crazy with these two fighting or those two fighting or three There's against one fighting. or, you know, whatever. And my tendency sometimes can be, turn the radio up really loud so I don't have to hear this, you know, because I'm just being lazy and I don't want to deal with it, you know. And I've been around Ashley before whenever she's like, oh, all day, that's all I do over and over. I'm so sick of this, you know? And as parents, don't we get that way? It feels like all the time. And sometimes we just want to be lazy and just tune them out. It'll go away. Let them figure out, let them beat themselves up, you know, whatever. You know, we don't even care just because we're tired, you know? And it is, it is hard work. It's not easy. It is tiring. And, but it's something that we can't give in on just because we're tired. We can't be lazy because they're the ones that are missing out. 
Third question to answer, what steps can I take to better discipline my child? Uh, first of all, decide that you will discipline. Uh, Proverbs 8, 8, uh, 1, 8, my son, listen to your father's discipline and don't neglect your mother's teaching. There's this idea that fathers and mothers were together and you kind of get, again, discipline is a form of teaching. Read the book of Hebrews. But there's that idea again that discipline is not just a physical thing. There's also the idea of, and we'll talk about this some more, but if you notice there's father and mother that are involved in this process of developing the child. That father and mother are both involved in teaching and discipline. And, you, and if you read the other points of Proverbs, you'll find out where the, the father is challenged to teach and to lead. That verse is not designed to say, dad's disciplines and mom teach. What it's designed, I believe, to say is, listen, guys, mom and dad in, in the eye of God were put in the life of the child in order to teach, discipline, and develop them. And discipline is not punishment, by the way. Discipline is something that's designed to simply bring about correction. So the first thing is decide that you will discipline. Just go, okay, bottom line is I'm not going to be selfish. I am not going to be doubting of God. I'm going to trust what God has to say. And I'm not going to be lazy. I am going to be someone who disciplines because I trust what God says and I love my kids. Secondly, second thing you can do, determine to discipline comprehensively. And what I mean by comprehensively is you probably have a mode of operation, an MO when it comes to your discipline. We all have a natural, you know, whenever, whenever again, I don't know why serial killers are coming up in a lesson about teenagers, but, uh, you know, the, the way that you track a serial killer is he has a, a, a mode of operation, the way that he functions, and they, there, there's just a default setting. And so for some, you have, you know, being someone who physically, you know, spanks the kids, that's just you. For others, you just yell. That's your natural, you know, you, you, you just yell. For some, you sit down and you just calmly talk. And all of those things are important, but you need to make sure that you're not just allowing what's natural for you to, to bring about the discipline of your child, but you need to make sure that you're allowing what Scripture says needs to happen to make sure that you're disciplining your child. And so let's talk about some areas of comprehensive discipline. The first area of discipline that you can use is simply talking to your child. Your child. More biblically, teaching your child. And sometimes if you talk to your child, you walk away going, I didn't teach him a thing. But the, hopefully the goal is that, is that you just teach him. And that's the very first line of defense and I think that in, uh, in discipline. Okay. Last night we had the kids and this kind of came up. Um, Lincoln asked me for scissors, and I said, no, you can't have any scissors. You know, someone's going to get hurt. They were in the other room playing. Uh, I went in there later, and there was stuff all over the floor, and there were the scissors in the floor. And I'm like, Lincoln, did you get the scissors? No, it was a scissor monster. Uh, well, what happened, after he got a whipping from his daddy that came in, uh, found out that his older brother took him in there, and he thought, well, since they're in here, I'll just go ahead and use them, you know. Um, so after he got, a little, he got his little butt spanked a little bit, but um, he was sitting down, and I got the opportunity to go up to him and just talk to him. I said, Lincoln, you know the Bible says children are to obey their parents. And so we got to have a conversation about that. I said, do you know why we're doing this? Why did I tell you you can't have them? Because you don't want me to get hurt. And I'm like, that's exactly right. Because why? Because you love me. And I'm like, exactly. You know, and that's another teaching opportunity to be able to share scripture with them, but also to let them know, I do this because I love you, because I care for you. I don't want to see you get your butt whipped. Right. You know, I'm trying to protect you. Yeah. That's kind of the guy's way of doing it. See, Lincoln, you touch the scissors and your butt hurts. <laughs> we knew that was going to happen. So that's just the way that it goes. And again, I think everybody growing up, I was never accused of being too soft to my kids. If anything, I was accused of being too hard. But, uh, and while I had no hesitancy in, in, in physical, you know, to, to spank my kids if needed, I was a talker. And, and Rita will tell you that well beyond when she thought we ought to talk. Ashley and I and hours Carrie and, and I. Hours and Ashley hours. Ashley and I uh, would be, that. we would literally, I mean, sometimes Three she'd come in, in at, a, at 11 o'clock and we'd start talking. When I say talking, I don't mean leisurely discussion, all right? You know what I mean? I'm talking about, oh, this is intense discussion about what's going on. And, but I just had an idea. That, number one, if I'm going to start a fight with a child, that I was going to make sure that I won that fight, not because of superiority, but to establish respect for authority that you don't get by with this. But we would talk for hours and sometimes, you know, till two or three in the morning, and always though with in view is, I want to get this dealt with before I go to sleep tonight, and this is important enough for us to deal with. 
Now, generally speaking, that was a good thing. Sometimes, I think, honestly, I would rather talk about it than doing the other things because I hated to discipline my kids. I hated to ground them because that's, they, they love people. They love the social activity. I hated spanking them because, it, you, know, you know, especially as they get older, it's just, it, it loses its effectiveness. And so I do think sometimes that was, there's some of it was about just wanting them to like me or wanting me not to be... But there is nothing wrong with trying to communicate with your, chi- your child the truth. Now understand, when there is something that's right and they've done something that's wrong, you're not negotiating a middle ground. You understand what I'm saying? They have misbehaved. What, getting them to understand that they've misbehaved is essential. You're not trying to somehow get them to where they've justified their misbehavior. And a lot of times the danger of talking is that we get in this negotiation kind of thing. That's not what talking in Scripture is about. If you notice, don't ignore your, your, your dad's discipline or your mother's teaching. There's a clear role of who the teacher is and who the student is in the talk of discipline. You are teaching your child. It doesn't mean you don't listen. And if you've got something out of line, then you need to change that and you need to be open. I was wrong. But so often it becomes this debate over something. It becomes this compromise. It becomes this, let's meet in the middle ground. Let's, you know, we're not, you know, we're not totally, I'm not totally, you're not totally wrong. You're just, you're just sort of wrong. When you talk with them, make sure you communicate what's going on. Again, Deuteronomy 6, 7 says, teach them to your children as he talks to these commands. Talk to them when you sit at home, when you walk around the road. Talk about them when you lie down and when you get up. It doesn't have to be reactionary for it to be discipline. You know, you may, you may see something in your child. There are things that I see in my grandchildren. I love my grandchildren, but if you ask me to look at them and say, what are some, or is there anything that you see flawed? I can see a very clear flaw, a sin that is, that is, a, is, is a besetting sin if they don't deal with it. And so I, I know that there's going to be some things about my grandkids that I'm going to be trying to not confront just overtly in their face sometimes, but just by talking about other situations. If I know a kid that's been prideful and his pride made him, you know, stand up for the wrong things, you know, just never admit he was wrong and end up destroying him, we'll talk about that. If there's, somebody, if there's some situation where somebody's selfish and they've, you know, they've went in and they've robbed, you know, they've stole from their mom and dad and they went to jail and, you know, there's, and I'll, I'll talk about how, you know, man, the, you see that this looks really horrible. I've had a talk with, with Malachi about, you know, that about Malachi. You see how this is Ashley smiling because she knew what I was talking about. Is it, is it do you see where this has led? And, and this why, Malachi, your mom and your dad, and, and we're talking to you about making sure you're not selfish. You never think selfishness is going to do these horrible things to you. But the root of this person's problem is selfishness. And it's a very subtle thing. You get to have somebody else's tragedy reveal how dangerous what you're doing. It's what really the whole Old Testament is about. These things happen to them as lessons for us, as warnings. Let somebody, you don't have to, you know, I guess I have to learn things the hard way. No, you don't. And your child doesn't either. You can talk with them about it. Another passage of Scripture, Deuteronomy 34, uh, 32, 46, he said to them, pay attention to all the words I've said to you today. Command your children to obey carefully everything these teachings. There's that discussion that goes on. Then there's the more forceful commanding. There comes a time where we go, I'm not talking about this. This is what you're going to do, period, end of story. And the truth is, if they don't learn that, they can argue with you, but there'll come a time when they're in a job or they're in a marriage that the person who is there won't put up with what you put up with. You're training them for the future. So determine to dis- discipline comprehensively, and the first thing you can do is you can start talking with them. That's the first, the first thing that you should do. Secondly. The second thing you should do is removal of privileges. Uh, and this was huge uh, for us, and it was really nice when they actually got their license. The kids were older, and they got their license. Uh, we would just take the car away. These are magical. And they're like, <laughs> and their faces were like, "Are you kidding me?" But you, you, know, you but, guys do have a ma- another magical kit in your tool, in your little magic box that I don't. We uh, never phones, had these. The phones and tablets. And they, they think they're dying. They really do. But they will survive. Our kids go to church camps once, stay for a week, and they don't have a phone. They don't have a tablet. And guess what? They survive. They do. And yeah. they actually learn to communicate and talk to each other. You know, you don't sit at the table with everybody on your phone or, you know, whatever. They learn to look at each other in the eye and carry on a conversation. We use those things. Those are great things to take away. With the grandkids, I'm like, they start fighting in the back. Give me the tablet. What? No. We won't. Give me the tablet. No, please, nothing. 
yes, give me the tablet. And so the tablet comes up, you know. But, I mean, it's a great tool to take away from them. I love it. If Solomon were alive today, he'd probably say, you can take your phone from their phone from them. It will not kill them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just like with discipline. Just take it. They won't die. They may think they are, but she's killing me. She's killing me. What happened? She took my phone. Not quite the same thing. In First Kings, the Bible has this recorded. And God is speaking. When the heavens are shut up and there's no rain because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray towards this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live and send rain on the land you gave your people for an inheritance. Now, what I want you to notice to do, it is the, it is the uh, removal of blessing. It's the refusal of God to enable their behavior by sending the rain and allowing the crop. And this is the writer saying, God, listen, man, you, you were, you've pulled back your blessing from our lives and you've got our attention. But you did say that when we turn to you and we pray to you that you'll hear us and we're asking you to do this. But we are aware, God, that one of the tools that you have in your disciplining toolbox is the ability to withhold blessing, to keep back from us the blessings, the privileges that we had if we were obedient. You want to read that? In Haggai 1, 10 through 11 says, Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. So once again, he, he just withheld from them. And sometimes, this is one of those cases, for me, it was always a lot easier, you know. Growing up, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I would be given the option. Okay, do you want to do this or you want to get a spanking? Anybody ever, did your parents ever give you that choice, you know? I wish they would give me the choice, do you want your dad to spank you or your mom to spank me? Because we know who I'm going for, I do anyway. Uh, but you give a choice. How many of you, let's say, how many of you had a, have a show of hands were ever given a choice of, of being spanked or having to do some chore or some, you know, stay in? How many of you chose the spanking? Raise your hand. Okay, over here, it seems like most. What, why did you choose the spanking? What? It won't last long, me too. I would always take the spanking. Now, it gives you insight, though, as you talk about discipline, there are times, which I think this proves the point, that the removal of privileges is more effective than spanking, right? To where sometimes, and again, I, I think we, we need to make sure that we don't use that as a justification. But here's the thing, for some parents, though, the reason that we do spank is so that we can get it over with. Yeah, it's harder on us. It's hard on us, man. If you, have, if you ground your kid to the house, you know, for a day, you got to put up with their whining and complaining all stinking day, right? Yep. You're grounded for a week. Honey, you sure you want to do that? You know what that means, right? Or you can't have really? your tablet. What are they going to do She may day? be fine. I'm going to leave you, right? You know what? It's honest. It's, it, it's, it's something, and we can be selfish that we do this, get it over with. You know, I think, again, it's the reason why sometimes we yell and make mighty proclamations and all say all these hard things. We go, okay, that's over now, and I can go back to doing what I need to do. But, there, but again, as we talk about discipline, talking has a role both in the, in the gentle reasoning that might go on and the commanding, the more authoritative, what would seem to be the child harsh. Also, the removal of privileges. You know, you, don't, you can't go out. My kids were always super social. Ashley and Carrie, you know, we taught them, honestly, to be social, uh, to love people and to try to, to, you know, care for them. So that's part of it, but part of it is their natural temperament. And to, to make them stay away from their friends and their, 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 you know, their events and stuff at, with, with school, man, that was, that was hard. When they got a car, they were always picking people up. They was taking them across chat, and we never took the, even when we took the car, on cross chat nights, they got their cars. Again, we wanted to, with, with reason, we wanted to teach them that, listen, there are things that this is not about just punish you, and the most important things is that you're loving God and loving lost people. But you ain't going anywhere but right there, and you're coming right back. On the other nights, I didn't care what was going on. Tough. You're, you're not going anywhere if you're grounded. And again, it's one of those things where you just look at God, and God says, listen, I did this. And he even writes to the people and says, this punishment isn't happening because of me. And with your kids, as you remove privileges, make sure that you're clearly communicating to them why you're doing and whose fault it is. I don't know if it's in our, in our lesson or not because we have so much to cover. 
But one of the things I suggest when you're disciplining your kids, and even before, is that you come up with a crime and punishment list for your family and for your children. And the cool thing is you can sit down and you can help them develop this along with you. Now, obviously, you are, you know, don't let the inmates run the asylum, okay? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, but, but you can play a cooperative role with them in this. But sit down, and there needs to be a sex, expect some clear definition of what is unacceptable in our family and then what is the punishment that follows and one of the things guys when you do that when you have a crime and punishment list that you've discussed that you that you talk with you take unfairness out of the picture and it's very easy for you to do what God does in Haggai to go remember all those commands that I told you not to, to disobey oh yeah you remember what I said would happen if you did disobey them yeah that just happened whose fault is it it is your fault and it's also good for the parents, for the husband and wife, because sometimes, you know, we don't agree sometimes on what kind of punishment fits what has just happened. And so if we have that set down, we know, okay, this is a mad issue. I'm taking them to the mat on this. This is going to happen. You know, so it helped us not to fight as much also. Yeah, and we've done uh, a lot of, you know, with, with parents who, and because there is such a discrepancy in how we discipline, it's one of the things that when we have couples that are, that are, removed from you know from from as far as distantly removed from how they think they ought to discipline we'll have them sit down and with their kids and we've done this with some families that were chaotic and it's amazing honestly it is absolutely amazing i'm thinking you know one one couple that we did it with they were in their early 40s and they had this they were they had been remarried but it was nine marriages uh five for one and four for the other in their more early 40s and they had six uh or seven kids blended together there and it was literally crazy and so we had them go through this and they did it and they were amazed at how they go I'm like man this is we haven't even had to fight about anything with our kids or with each other and then they began to compromise and it wasn't six months later until the consistency of their discipline waned and the consistency of the problem returned but make a crime and punishment list based upon what's right and wrong obviously from scripture is where you want to find where we want to we want to form that but form it from scripture but also for what fits your family and, and the good thing is, by the way, when you, when you use God as the standard of what's right and wrong, you take you out of the picture. Uh, because I think if we're honest, you know, all of us could say, well, I get on, we get on to the kids, but then we end up in a bigger fight than anybody, you know. And so making sure that you guys get on the same page, because eventually the kids will use that too. Yeah. Ashley the other day had a conversation with, with some kids that are, that are really close to us, and they've, their mom and dad has went through a divorce, and the kid was was saying, man, I just, both of them in the back seat, saying, man, I just feel like I'm torn between my mom and my dad. My mom wants to have us on Sunday so we can go to church, and, and, and I know, you know, that's good, but my dad wants us to go work with him, and he doesn't want us to go to church, and I'm just torn in between, and I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know what to do, and, and Ashley said, here, why don't you do this? Who, who, are you a Christian? And I think what I'm said, yeah. He said, then why not not make it about your mom or your dad? And he was like, well, what do you mean? He says, well, why don't, instead of asking what would please mom or what would please dad, why don't you ask what would please God? What does God want? Like with church, what does God want you to do? Does he want you to go work and not be at this together? Or does he want you to, oh, well, he wants us to be there. Obviously, he wants me to be at church. Okay, is that about your mom or your dad? Well, that's about neither. And she said, so why don't you start making your decisions based upon God? And then you can go to your hut, you can go to your mom or your dad. You go, Dad, listen, this isn't about me standing up for my mom. This is about my relationship with God. And this, is about me not, this isn't about me not liking you. This is about my relationship with God. One thing that you do as parents, and, and this is true whenever you have the natural discrepancies in how we discipline. It, it tends to be the women generally in my experience are, are tend to be softer there are some examples and exceptions to that we have them in our church here but here's the thing there, there are just discrepancies that, that that are there then guys when you have a blended family especially then you have the whole mine and yours things and you do as a parent understandably but foolishly what these kids are doing as in the product of divorce they're making it about their mom or their dad and i want you to know your kids are not your kids you know, the Bible says that you're entrusted, God has entrusted you with something of His. And the worst thing you can do is ask, what do I think about this? You'll cause a fight in your family. You'll cause a rift, whether you're in a blended family or in a family like ours. If God is at the center of your discipline and expectation, you open yourself up for it to be about you, for sides, for the kids to be selected. You're mad at them. They're mad at you. You're mad at each other. Just make it about God. And stop justifying and stop being defensive. 
What does God expect? And I don't care if it's mine, yours, or the kid nine streets, nine, not from the house nine streets down the road that, that's, that's here all the time. This is about what God would want. And make sure you're doing it in a godly way, but just make it about God. But again, it, it's just important that, that you are willing to say, hey, I, I, I am completely open. I'll talk. I'll remove privilege. And then finally, a third thing that, you, that uh, is important is physical discipline, spanking. And again, it's important for us to not overreact. We're not talking about beating. Because someone, do you, know, do you realize that we get so sometimes illogical? There are many of us in here that were spanked, but we were never abused, right? I mean, I, I, I don't look back. The hardest whooping I ever got, that my dad apologized to me in front of a class for, was one that I look back and go, oh, man, I shouldn't have been so stupid because I asked for it. And I never once thought, oh, he's, you know, I remember going, man, that was just really dumb. All my friends are like, Robert, you have no brain. Why did you do that? I told them what happened. They're like, they never went, oh, your dad's a mean guy. They're going, you're just an idiot there, Robert. So we need to differentiate. There are, kid, there are parents who, who kill, the, beat their kids, and that's wrong. But don't allow the abuse to stop you from spanking. What would it be? Have you ever heard of... I read this last week in the St. Louis Post about a family, uh, a mom and dad that starved their child to death. You guys that read, it, read that? So how many of you are tend to go, well, okay, I'm never going to take a candy bar away from my kid because I don't want to slide into that I'm, I could starve them to death. <laughs> right? There are families out there, parents, that starve their kids to death. Don't be afraid about taking dessert from them, Okay? And I think sometimes you go, oh, that's just silly. I think sometimes the same thing is true with, with physical discipline that's there. Now, again, as we talk about it, you've got to ask the question, okay, when, when do I go from talking to beginning to remove privileges to beginning to spank? And there's some guidelines that are on your, on your paper there that we're just going to walk through. Uh, first of all, when, when, when do I spank? Well, when you're not out of control. If you are out of control, if you're feeling like you're out of control, oh, I'm just so mad I can't control this, back off. And just stop. Because regardless of, of what it looks like, when somebody gets abused, there is an anger issue that's going on within the person that is disciplining them. And so one of the things, whenever if I was super angry about something that happened, I would make sure that I took a breath, that I would back away. And so don't discipline. One of the things, you don't discipline when you're angry at the person. Now, you can be angry for the person. There's times when God got angry because of what he was angry for them because they were endangering themselves. But don't do it when you're out of control. Uh, the next one is when you tell them you're going to. Now, I think that's, you know, a lot of times as parents, I've heard this, I've done this myself. We will say, if you do that again, I'm going to spank you. They do it again, and we say, if you do that again, I'm going to spank you. Third time they do it. They're, they're like, well, I get by with it doing it two or three times, and she's really not going to spank me, or he's really not going to spank me. If you say you're going to spank them the first time, spank their butts the first time. Don't give them the second and the third chance, because they will start using that against you if you do that. If they, are, you, they can't be taught to ignore authority and respect authority at the same time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I was in the bathroom at a, at a department store one time, and I parent came in, a dad, I'm assuming, I was in the bathroom stall, so I'm not sure. Uh, maybe it was a mom who just didn't want him to know. But uh, came in, and the kid was just throwing a fit, and, and, and it was a dad, and the dad says, I'm, you're going to stop that right now. And the kid just keeps going, and I hear him kicking the wall and stuff. You're going to stop that. I'm, I'm going to count to three. One. All oh, hell's breaking loose, you know. I said I was going to count to three. One. And I'm in the bathroom going, no, one and one, that's two, two. That's where you're at. Two. You're not only a bad parent, you're bad at math. Come on, that's two. And then he talks to him again. He said, I, and, and he, in between, I'm literally, there's 30 or 40 seconds, the kid, and he's telling me, he said, I told you that. Uh, one. And he, said, he, and I, he goes, one. I'm in the bathroom, I'm going, three. That's three. Let the beatings begin. Come on. And it goes on, and he goes through one three times. He goes through two twice. He goes, I'm telling you, and no joke. He goes, 
two and a half. And I had figured out by then he wasn't good at basic, basic math. He shouldn't move into fractions, you know what I mean? Because he wasn't going to do well. And the kid never, ever straightened up. And so as I come out, he's got the kid by the arm. And the kid's got his thing, his feet planted. He's dragging him. He comes, opens the door. He goes out. The kid grabs the door. And they go down the aisle with the kid doing the same thing. When you give a person to the count of three, when they know something is wrong, you give them two chances to disregard you. When you say you're going to discipline, discipline. And if you're not going to discipline, shut up and at least be honest, okay? Because they don't need a parent that's just going to lie to them about something as important as that. So in any of the forms, whatever it be, taking something, don't threaten a million times. The Bible talks about in Scripture where justice isn't swift that the people learn to rebel. That's not just true with, with, a, nation, with a nation. If, if, if we aren't, I disobeyed much. Now, my dad, when my dad would spank me, he would teach me, you know, I'm like, man, I don't want to get that again. My dad was like, whoa, wow. But he was gone a lot. And I remember calculating in my mind and not, you know, because I wasn't good at math either or fractions, but I'm going, I can't buy with this several times without much chance of getting caught. So if I do this 10 or 11 times, get caught once, that means about every six months I'm going to get a spanking. The cost-benefit ratio seems, so I get six, five times of, or six times of enjoyment for one time of pain. I'll take that bid, Right? And one of the things I think with my dad, honestly, my mom was so insecure and it mattered so much that I, you know, that she couldn't accept the problems that I had because she would transpose those on herself, another form of dysfunction. She couldn't acknowledge that I was messed up because messed up kids come from a messed up parent, a messed up mom. So what I'll do is I'll just be messed up, but I'll live in denial like I'm not. Huge contributor to, to me being the struggles that I had huge con contributor that was to me not being able to come to grips with who I really was uh, with accuracy. And so it, it's super important that, that as, we, as we do those things that we have a consistency that is there. And if my dad would have been there, the one thing with my dad, my dad would have, my dad would have said, toughen up. You're acting, with my mom, she covered up. And when she covered up, I never knew what I really was. One time my mom made a teacher apologize. She went to the school board and made a teacher apologize to me because of the way that he disciplined me. I was in fifth grade and he got a sheet that was like off a, a bed and made it into a diaper and had me put it on and he put me on a stool. <laughs> he put me on a stool in front of the class and gave me a slow poke sucker. And he loved it because he got the Yeah, who cared? Did. People are laughing. I've got a slow poke sucker. Who's the guy's, what punishment is this? I can pee my own pants and it won't matter. You know what? Hey. <laughs> and my mom was furious. And I remember her, and she caused a fit. And my dad said, you know, if you wasn't acting like a three-year-old, he, he wouldn't treat you one. You need to stink and grow up. You know who I got more esteem from out of that? I did. Without a question. My mom made me feel more like the incompetent little baby. My dad said, you're acting like that, but you can grow up. Just a consistency, when you, and sometimes consistency seems hard, but it needs to be there. Where are we at now? Um, well, I, I told you my deepest, darkest <laughs> secrets, okay? Uh, when me they, and Billy Madison, all right. When they are young, um, you can start disciplining. If you start disciplining them when they're young, it's going to be easier as they get older. Uh, and it goes back to what I was telling you with Ashley. She was maybe one whenever she knew exactly what she was doing. She would look at me and go back to it, look at me, go back to it. She knew what she was doing. Uh, the other day we were somewhere and somebody had a baby and the baby, as soon as the parent sat down, the baby, you know, stopped crying. I mean, started crying. <laughs> Screaming their head off. They stood up, guess what happened? Stopped crying. Sat back down. <laughs> stood up, guess what happened? stop crying you know They're, and this baby's probably one around one years old so they know at a young age and if you start teaching them at a young age it's not so hard as they get older if you teach them when they're little and the things that we're talking about with spanking really have to do with talking and everything else there just there has to be this consistency that's there and so you know when you talk with them you guys you don't want to talk with them you're out of control right i have zero problem with you telling your kid they've done something stu stupid i have a problem when you call your kid stupid you know, the Bible says that there are things that we do that are stupid. The Bible says things that we do that are foolish. There's things that we do that, that but, but making sure that it's, it's an action, not a person, that it's a verb that we're talking about and not a noun. 
when you're out of control, you tend to, to personify, you know, the, the, the negative emotion, and it makes, you, you put them in a rut. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, when, when you're talking, you can just, when you're explosive, you'll say it, and it doesn't do any good. So whether it's taking privileges or whatever, you do it when you're not out of control. You, you, you do it when you tell them you're going to. Start when they're young. Just start when they're really young, teaching them, when, guys. When we talk about spanking them when they're that young, we're talking about, you know, and if you do it on their butt through their diaper, they can't even feel it. Yeah. You know, I'm not talking about yep. whipping them with a belt or something like that. I'm talking about you get their attention, they know, oh, that. That's Between the cotton and everything else that's in there, they barely feel it, but right, they know. Right, exactly. Uh, whenever and wherever it's called for, uh, you know, the, the kids sport, will manipulate. The and, and I never, I, th I take that back. I think I spanked my kids one time in front of, uh, you know, when we were out. I always took them to the bathroom or somewhere that was private because I'm, my goal isn't to embarrass them. Uh, the one time that I did, it was obvious that my kids were manipulating the situation. I don't remember if it was Carrie or Ashley, but I thought, you know, the reason they're doing this in public is as they think they can get they by can with this in public. They learn that really quick, especially in so the grocery store. I decided you want to try to make a public victory. We'll have a we'll have a public war here. We did what and, we called the Spock on them, and that would get their attention right here. You can't hurt them, but if you pinch right there a little bit, it gets their attention real quick, and people can't see it. No, <laughs> They knew. They saw it coming. If any of you have ever well read, I think it's, it's Dobson's book, The Strong-Willed Child, where he's the first one that I ever read about that. James yep. Dobson talks about how there is no, Dr. James Dobson, no physical damage at all. It's one of the places that pain is more sensitive with no damage. Mm -hmm. And I thought, good, cool. They hurt. I have little... So if our kids do this when you walk up to them. <laughs> okay. That's why. That's why Carrie's got a bad neck, probably. But again, there, there's a time, you know, and again, I, I think it is important to know, you know, you live in a culture now that you have to be super careful yeah. about doing when, you know, I'm not talking about spanking your kids all, I'm saying, be very, but there is always a place that you can pull them aside. You can take them to the car. You can go, if you need to, if it's that, if they're rebelling, you can go home mm -hmm. and deal with the things. Mm -hmm. But don't, you know, the kids learn when they're in public, they can yell and do whatever because mommy or daddy's not going to do everything. They have these, like, these, these, you know, I used to go goose hunting whenever I was growing up, and it was just weird because where I was, uh, at the beginning of the year, the geese would fly out, and man, they'd fly all over this field where we hunted. By the end of the year, they would fly, you'd see them coming towards you, and right as they came towards you, right as they came to the highway, they made a right <laughs> and headed south. I'm going, why are they doing that? Well, number one, they're getting shot at when they head straight, and they're, okay, <laughs> that's kind of smart. But it was refuge. They couldn't get in trouble there. And they learned the boundaries. So they learned that they could quack their heads off and do whatever they wanted to as long as they were, they could poop on anybody's car, lungs or anything, as long as they're in the refuge. And our kids are much like those geese. They're, well, they have these ideas to where we, we, they think they can misbehave. They've learned the boundary, the refuge. And you need to make sure that you're the one that draws the lines. And you can remove those lines and make sure that you're teaching them to respect authority. Another thing, when is it, when, when, when it, should, you, should you spank, whenever there's spanking specifically, when there's willful disobedience. You don't, we never spank over a mistake. Right. You know, that makes, that makes zero sense. But spanking was reserved whenever there was a defiance that was there. If they, uh, the one thing with our kids that they knew and the grandkids know, you do not tell me no. That's gonna be a definite spanking right there. If you look at me and I've told you to do something and you go, no, that's it. They know. They're getting their butt spanked. That's right. They never could do that. Yeah, you say you hate me, I'll say I love you and let me speak in the language butt. of SWAT. That's right. That's right. We'll pound out a rhythm on that little tail till you get this <laughs> message down, okay? Or if they hit at you, you know, you, go to, I, you see it in stores all the time now. You know, kids will be hitting their parents. They will be trying to get, and they're just kicking and hitting and whatever. I'm like, no, that, that, didn't have, that does not happen. My kids never <laughs> said, I hate you. My kids never swatted at me. No, Ashley that did, we knew try, of, Ashley did try to headbutt me one time. Yes, but. she did. He backed her up against the wall, pinned her with his head. <laughs> and but she was a teenager then, okay? So she, she has... spit in her face. She, she has a short-term insanity defense as a teenager, so... <laughs> It was funny, though, because she did. She sort of leaned her head forward to hit mine. And as soon as I leaned in, rather than going, oh, wow, what did you do? I could see in her eyes this look of, oh, no, what did I just do? 
They called him Robert's demon eyes. They knew when they So we would we talk for about the next ten minutes with my head <laughs> pinning her head up against the wall. <laughs> we have to tell a Carrie story now too. Then you can't. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the like difference the time, is like, the difference in Carrie and Ashley is the difference in my brother and I. My brother was sneaky bad, and I was just bad. And okay? Carrie would make me laugh. And he would do Ashley and Carrie laugh. were honestly both really good kids, and, and, but they, Carrie did tend to be more sneaky than Ashley. So. <laughs> so, but when there was willful disobedience, if there was, if there was a, uh, something that, that was just, they were asserting their authority, then we were going to step in and let them know that you can't do that. You know, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden because they tried to assert their authority in a way that would damage them forever, and it did. Another thing, when there's habitual disobedience, if it happens over and over and over and over again, the same thing, you know, it may not, sometimes it, it, willful disobedience and habitual, you may be going, you know, defiance and, and habitual doesn't always have the same thing, but at some point, there, there comes a time whenever a kid, you have to get their attention with something that's happening over and over and over and over again. You know, if somebody forgets their homework, a kid forgets their homework, uh, especially if you have my temperament or Carrie's temperament or Jackson's temperament or Lincoln's temperament. Or uh, That can be natural. I mean, Carrie lost a winter coat one time in his desk <laughs> at school. I'm not kidding. There's buried. that coat. It was buried in his desk. How do you do that? <laughs> you know, some perverse kid stole my coat. No, you just under nine <laughs> layers of other junk in there. But at some point when they're not doing their homework at all, it's not just a matter of weakness, it's a matter of rebellion. And the, the repetitive habitual nature says that. And then the last one we have on there, and this isn't the last, this isn't comprehensive, but when you have it when a bad attitude persists, uh, respect is a good attitude. Uh, and, and respect doesn't mean you always have to like it. But because the book of Hebrews says, and, and just to throw this in there, guys, don't expect your kids to like your discipline. And with, when the book of Hebrews says no discipline is painful, uh, is pleasant but painful, pain always brings out a, a response. And so don't expect them to always smile. That's, that, that doesn't allow them the freedom that they need to process to where you're making them par- just act like you're, that's not what we're saying. It's okay for them to not like it. You know, when a kid's been spanked, there's a physical pain that they're feeling and crying is a natural way that the human body deals with pain. Now, understand, don't let them, you know, I've saw kids get, you know, swatted on, swatted on the butt and cry for three months. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, later on, they're still crying. For, for a, and you can get online and you can check out some of the, the things that are, that, that'll give you more scientific data than this. But crying initially is at a release of emotion that helps you deal with pains. There's endorphins that are released. It helps you process. But there's a time whenever crying becomes just simply further rebellion to where it's, you're, you're, you're that they are saying, I hate you, well, they're using their tears and their manipulation to do that. So again, you know, when, when you spank a child, don't expect them to smile and say, thank you, I, I needed that. And, and don't expect them, you know, right? Don't, don't spank them and go, okay, you, you have three seconds to dry that up. Right. When's the last time you were crying about something you could dry it up in three, three seconds? seconds yeah. So, but, but don't let them go into manipulation. And so you've got to watch some lines that are there. And there are probably some other things that we can talk about uh, the, the last thing is that we've got there is that you just need, as we talk about how do you, how do, you do this, just make sure, decide, determine uh, to discipline consistently. In 1 Samuel 3.13, the Bible says, I warned him continually that judgment is coming for his family because his sons are blaspheming God and he hasn't disciplined them. Now, there's a couple of things that are there that are important. You've got the father, Eli, being held responsible for his sons. He goes, the reason I'm, that I'm killing your sons is because you wouldn't step in and do anything but talk to them about it. He holds the parent responsible, the dad specifically responsible, not because the kids are bad, but because you didn't play a role in disciplining them. But I want you to notice what God says about even that. He goes, I continually, what's the word that we've got there on that last one, sorry? How's it phrased? I continually, I, I, I warned him continually that judgment was coming. There's a continual warning. There's a continual uh, consistency of discipline. And so when this happens, God doesn't feel somehow like, oh, man, I wish I'd have given him a chance. He'd given him all the chances. And if he, is, if he didn't take advantage of it, it wasn't because God had not disciplined him. God had not directed him. So make sure that you're consistent in your discipline. Okay, we're going to uh, have a period of time for question and answer uh, for just about 
10 minutes here. It is 2.30, 129, I mean, 129. So if you have some questions, if we have a mic, and we'll try to fly through these. And the, the section on responsibility will fly through that. It won't take us but about two hours. And so, uh, no, it'll take us about, we'll fly through in 15 minutes. And you have these notes, and you can look at them at home. Uh, but we wanted to give you a chance. So question, this is the one I think that, that probably we struggle with a lot. Uh, so anybody have a question? We got several of them. So with Emmett, he, I know you talk about crying is manipulation. He will start crying before we spank. Um, so there's the manipulation there. So I'm kind of like, hey, dude, you need to dry it up because he was already crying. So I don't know the balance of how long do I let him cry if he was already crying before. Well, I didn't wonder if my kid's crying. I think it's manipulation. It's not, I'm not going to put off the... the, the no, you know, I which, still spank him. Yeah, what I'm saying is I wouldn't, I, that would be a non-factor of me. I would just, you know... You've heard somebody say, I'll give you a reason to cry. That's probably my approach would be, I'll give you a re reason to cry, okay? You know, that, that, if, uh, that if you want to, but, and again, with that, it, it's important to recognize in the discipline that God, God punishes us someday will be punished eternally, and there'll be no hope. He disciplines us now, so there is hope. So as we're spanking, as we're directing our kids, it's understanding that the goal is not simply to punish them, it is to train them and to teach them. And ultimately, it's what we're talking about today, to teach them to respect the authority that's in their lives. The thing is, guys, if they don't respect you as their father, they're not going to respect God as the father. And you may not, you go, I don't know about that. Well, think about how many of you in here who had abusive, deadbeat fathers and how that created an impediment for you when the Bible talks about God being a father. Right? Any of you girls? How many of you have had a struggle when the Bible talks about God being a father going, I have a disconnect from that? Raise your hand. Most girls and guys that come from an abusive or a deadbeat kind of situation, a benign kind of neglect situation, they have problems relating to God because of what they saw in, in their parents. And again, that just again cements this reality. If they don't respect your authority, they're not going to respect God's authority. And he knows that. So that we, you teach them to respect authority. I think, I think my question was more, where do I draw the line of the manipulation after the spanking versus he's just crying because it's pain? Well, and again, I, I, I don't know how long, you know, that, that goes, but I would think, you know, I don't think most crying goes on after a spanking more than a minute or two uh, that's actually crying for, for pain. And then you can talk with him. You can reaffirm them. And, you know, I, I, my kids were not longtime criers, but I, I, I think I know what I would do if they wanted to use... The, that is manipulation that I just send them to their bed where they cry by themselves. Somebody else? Um, so Hadley, if anybody knows her, she's really sassy. And um, she tends to, I guess whenever I do discipline her or I'll tell her something, she'll go, I am. Or like she will continue to, even after she gets disciplined, say, yeah, she would, like, justify it and get that last word. But, like, sometimes, I think sometimes, and I could just be wrong, she's not aware of even her tone that she's using because she uses it so much. And so I see her, and I'm trying to get her to stop, and she continues to say, I'll say, say yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. No. She's yes, aware of it, Shantae. Yes, ma'am. She's aware of it. <laughs> like, yeah, I, th okay, I think our so. kids are much more aware than what, what are there. And I think the key to that, honestly, is consistency. The thing that Tim talked about earlier, with Tim earlier about there being, about, you know, feeling like you're always disciplining your kids. All of us have went through that, but the thing is, and it doesn't have to be spanking every time if, it's, if there's this real rebellious spirit, then you can, but just make distant. Every time that she does that, you, she suffers some consequence, and when she comes back, you sit down with her and connect the consequence with the behavior. And, but guys, most, most of the time, those kinds of behaviors point to our consistency, our inconsistency. Now, the, the more strong-willed and stubborn someone may be, the more that you may have to push that. You know, obviously, somebody's a compliant kid. You may do something once, and, you know, and they're like, okay, I'll take care of it. My brother was more like that. He'd get in trouble. You know, his behavior would mod be modified you know, for a month. I got my be in trouble, and my behavior was modified for a minute. You know what I mean? There was, I was just much more stubborn. And probably some of that is my parents accepted altering behavior without altering my attitude. 
So I would just make sure you're super consistent. The enemy uh, of, your, of your discipline is your inconsistency. And, and again, as we talk about this, we are talking about preparing our kids for life and eternity. This is not about what we want our home, making our home this nice, peaceful place. This is about creating a kind of child that's well-rounded, that can go into society and function in a way that allows them to be blessed and to be a blessing to where their life is good. I remember Ashley got furious with me one time, maybe as mad as she'd ever been at me other than the headbutt time. Uh, but one time whenever she was, she, whenever I said, Ashley, you got to deal with this, this attitude or, you, or you're going to have, you know, guys are going to have trouble in the long haul. Man, I love you more than I love my life. And I remember she looked at me, so you're saying I'm getting a divorce. And I'm like, no, that's not exactly what I was saying, but yeah, kind of, okay. Uh, the, the, yeah, she got her, she goes, I got her divorced before she had a chance to get, to get married. Uh, but again, just with all of that that goes on, I, I wasn't saying any of that because I was mad at her or because I didn't care for her. And that's why when you're out of control, discipline is always for the benefit of the person that's disciplining. That's the very first thing you recognize in Scripture. It's always a discipline of God. It isn't just to vent his anger. It's for our benefit. Whenever the immoral brother at Corinth is being disciplined, it's not, to, it's not just, you know, to protect God's holiness, although that is, you see in the passage, but the first reason is listed so this guy's soul could be saved. So that consistency has to be there and the consistency that it's for their benefit. We're not just talking about doing this because we want to have kids that people go, oh, you've got good kids. Man, I love watching Ashley and RJ and the grandkids and, and Carrie and Hannah and the, and the grandkids live in a way to where they're blessed and they're blessing others. It's just an incredible thing to know, you know, that someday I'll be gone, but they'll be taken care of. You know, they're, they're, they got people that love them. They have a mate that loves them, and they have kids that love them. And a lot of that happened, honestly, because of discipline in their lives when they were younger. And it doesn't matter whether you're, again, I said Carrie and Ashley were, were honestly teachers, you know, and, and, you know, people, you know, Ashley was always the, Carrie not quite so much probably on this end, Ashley was always like the favorite of, of the teachers, and Carrie was more, you know, sarcastic sometimes probably like me and things, and so, but everybody would recognize that they were good kids. It's, it wasn't just, a, but it was about helping them become what they needed to do to be what God wanted them to do, trusting that if they're what God wants them to be, they've got the greatest chance at life. So consistency for the right reason. Somebody else? Yeah. Uh, so I really believe that, you know, constant discipline, it's, it's crucial. But uh, when do you think it's a good time to teach him about God's mercy? Well, I think that... Uh, Again, I, I, don't, I don't think there's a, there's a, I don't think there's a, a, a conflict between discipline and God's mercy. If you look at the book of Hebrews, you get the idea that, that there is this kindness that God is, is showing to them. And even discipline is an act, you know, is an act of kindness. If you look at the pig pen, I love uh, Smalley and Trent. Is it Smalley and Trent's book on, on uh, how people grow, is that the one I'm thinking of, or making small groups work, where he talks about how the pig pen was an act of God's mercy, that the, father, the boy deserved to die. So I think it's important to realize that, that, you know, that, that, our, that God disciplines us not because we deserve it. He disciplines us because, he, because of his mercy, because he doesn't want to have to punish us eternally. So I think you, you, it, you, you discipline them, and you have to have consistent discipline, but just life in general, as you talk about, you know, as they, as they learn about God, uh, the severity and, and, and kindness of God are, are matched together as, a, as two parts of, of God's holiness and his goodness. And so just, you know, with my kids, I never had any, I don't think I had a problem consistently disciplining them. I also didn't ever have a problem consistently telling about God's love and God's kindness. But you don't teach them the kindness of God by letting up on discipline. That's not kindness, that's hatred. We've already talked a little bit about that, and sometimes we go, well, I'm just trying to be kind. There's nothing kind. And again, I love my mom. I don't know what my mom's upbringing was like, but there was nothing kind about her closing her eyes to who I was. It wasn't kind. Uh, kindness is helping me see who I am and helping me become who I can be. Now again, with all of that, Discipline has to be done within the context. 
it's, an, it's, it's about love for God and, and for your child. And so whenever I would discipline my kids, I would talk to them about why I'm doing this. I mean, I've talked with, with man, I've had some really hard talks with Jackson and, and, and Malachi about, you know, about pride and selfishness and about how in the middle of this hard talk about, man, how blessed you are. God has been so good to you and you're going to respond to God like this. So there's a simultaneous, and and it's the kindness of God in the backdrop that allows the words of discipline to be more meaningful if they get it. So I think it's a constant. When do you discipline? Consistently. When do you teach them about the the, the mercy of God? Consistently. Over and over again. But they are not in opposition to each other. God in his mercy disciplines us or we'd be a mess. Right? So our kids are a little bit older now, um, 11 and 12, and the issue comes up to where when they're being preteens, you know, like disobedience, saying no, having persistent bad attitudes and things like that, sometimes taking away electronics can be effective, but if you take it away for a week, then it's just like overreacting, I guess, or but I feel like for a day, it's not really doing much, and they're consistent bad attitudes and just disrespectful. And one thing that has worked is when they're being disrespectful to me or they're fighting and stuff like that is I give them a chore. And if it continues, they get another chore. And then it realigns them a little bit to be able to talk through some of their bad attitudes and stuff. At what point, though, there's been times where I've just pulled them over aside and spanked them. But it's kind of a, I don't know, we're not really on the same page with that because they are getting bigger. Now, obviously, more than going into eighth grade might not be appropriate, but right now I feel like he's still very immature and needs that, you know what I mean, learn that respect and kind of regroup, I guess. I don't know. And again, I wish, you know, when you look at the Old Testament, again, as we try to find everything in God, I don't know when they stop spanking their children in the Jewish households of the Old Testament. I know that they have the bar mitzvah, this celebration of adulthood when they're 13 years old, uh, to where there's an expectation that was there. And you see some things with Jesus, you know, when he's a little bit older. To me, when our kids begin to get to teenager, teen years, spanking no longer carries, it brings resentment rather than results. Uh, but, I, but again, I, I think there are, there's still plenty of other options. You know, to, t- to take away a phone away for a week it is to me is mild if they're having a, a persistent attitude. Uh, to me, getting a hammer and smashing their phone in front of their faces would probably not be over the top much if the attitude was bad enough. And I'm not joking about that. You know, I, there, he smashed toys before. Yeah, I, I, you know, years ago, Jackson was Jackson was lying all the time. And you guys have probably heard this this story, but not, but Jackson was. I said, Jackson, when you're out of my house, and uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna lie. I'm going to smash your, one of your toys. He looks at me, and he doesn't wonder if I will, I don't think. I think he knows I would. But I said, Jackson, here's why. I don't know anybody who lies to the people they love that have good relationships. I said, when you lie in a relationship, you damage it. And the more that you do it, you damage it beyond repair. And you'll never be able to put it back together again. So do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Jackson, what's going to happen the next time you lie? You're going to smash my toy. You got it. So what does he do? He lies. And so we go out in the garage, and I tell Kennedy, which I shed this devilish smile on her face, <laughs> go get one of Jackson's toys. And I said, don't get, one that he, don't get one of his favorite ones, but don't get one that he doesn't give a rip about. Get one that he's going to, oh, man, and maybe he has a good memory. So he goes out, and I had a hammer. And I said, Jackson, do you want to br- smash the toy, or do you want me to? I don't want to smash the toy. You want me to? No. Um, <laughs> there's not a choice here. And so I, I, and actually I used a brick and we smashed the toy. And I said, I had him pick it up and go throw it away. He came down, we're sitting on the garage on the step. I put my arms around him. He's got tears. And I said, Jackson, listen, lying matters. That toy doesn't. And you're going to, you, you won't have good relationships. You're going to find yourself in problem with your mom, with your dad, with your sister, with your teacher, with everybody. Nobody's ever going to be able to respect you if you lie. And I know you can do better. So I love you, and we prayed together, and we went back in, and the rest of the evening was okay. 
I think sometimes what, you know, the, 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 the wounding of an emotion sometimes is the key to the shaping of character. And we think that if, you know, when, when the Hebrew says, when the Hebrew writer says, you've forgotten the commandment where God addresses you as children, don't take the Lord's discipline lightly because they're, they're, oh, they're, and he says, you just need to endure this because this is producing in you something. It's going to allow you to share in God's holiness. The pain that they were suffering was an ingredient in their sharing in the holiness of God. And again, that's what we're talking about discipline today for. What's it about? It's not about us. Discipline helps our kids become more like God when it's properly meted out. And again, some of this, guys, there's things that you know your kid. I don't know your kid, but I do know that consistency is super important. Ashley, what are you thinking? Well, I mean, you went through high school. Did I? I <laughs> and I think she probably knows now what she might have known then. The whipping was not about what she did. The whipping was about the attitude that she just had about authority and about my role. I think I whipped Car- Carrie. Do you remember how old you are when you got your last whipping? Where's Carrie? He was a senior. <laughs> he, was a senior. <laughs> he, didn't get a, he didn't get a whipping, but you did have him by the collar dangling a little bit in the air one time. Yeah. I remember. I that. think he was. I think Carrie honestly was was maybe in eighth grade the last time that I that I whipped him. I remember whenever my dad's whipping stopped working on me. Yeah. I remember him work. grabbing my by the arm, and and again, my dad had not been the most consistent. My dad was a, but he had to work shift work, so I was in school from you know eight till three, and he went to work from three to eleven. So I got by with a lot, and then he was used, you know, when I'd really done something really horrible that my mom didn't want anybody else to know about, he would, she would tell my dad, and my dad would come back, you know, three days later and whip me. And I remember when he grabbed me and whipped me, and he's whipping me, and it's a hard whip, and I remember going, you can beat the crap out of me. It's not going to make any difference. I didn't say that out loud because I wasn't stupid at that point. But I do remember it's, this doesn't work. I need a mic over here, or Chuck's got one, sorry. Uh, so Sterling is getting to the point where he is, like, we feel like we're always disappointing him, but... He's getting to the point now where when he gets in trouble, all he tries to do is make us laugh. So Carrie Cox. And, and he's really Carrie. really funny. So how do like how do we like I I have a really hard time like keeping a straight face whenever he's like doing it because it is really funny. So how do we go from like when he does get us to laugh to bring it back to like Still dealing with the situation. Again, this just That's goes with hard, your. That's though. That is hard because Carrie not, was the master of that. Yeah, you carry what's good. And I would even it. have to go. I, and it doesn't matter if you laugh. You just go, ha, 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 get to your room. <laughs> or, ha, 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 bend Enjoy. over. <laughs> That's hilarious. I would have laugh all the time. I'm spanking you. Again, there's nothing wrong with him being funny. But he's using that to manipulate, just like crying. So just, if he doesn't receive a benefit from the manipulation, they stop manipulating. The basis of all manipulation is that you derive a benefit from it. And here's the thing. If you allow your child through their anger or their humor to derive a benefit from you, then they will keep doing it, and they learn that later on. But I'm telling you what, you know, uh, you, know you, you get in a marriage, and you've got a husband who's had an affair, who hasn't been caring about his wife. The wife doesn't care how funny she, he is. She'll just go find someone who meets the needs. That manipulation stops at some point. And the question is, are we going to have it stop when they can go ahead without the scars? Now, the scars may be what's necessary, but they should never have to have scars from their own stupidity whenever we as parents might be able to mold them in a way that would allow them to prevent that. So just, you know, again, there's nothing wrong with laughing, but, and there's times with Carrie to where I know when, when I'm laughing, I go, that's funny, but, bud, you're going to get your butt whooped. <laughs> and, you know, there's times with Ashley, when it's, there's nothing wrong with humor. They're just funny. It just doesn't change anything. <laughs> right? It's like who asks about, he keeps crying. I am it. Man, I wish you wasn't crying because I have to whip you and you have to keep crying then too. That your crying doesn't change anything. The discipline, this is what's right. This is the expectation. Here's the, here's the punishment that's there for you. Go to your room. Give me your phone. Hilarious joke. I'm going to text that to me while I have your phone. 
Uh, and I'm, I'm completely serious. There's nothing wrong with it, but you just don't allow it to impede what you're doing. Realizing that manipulation that doesn't yield a benefit stops. And if they get off because of it, then they'll keep it up. Somebody had the microphone there. Yeah, and, and again, that's when being wise to where we're talking about, you know, obviously I said I, I think one time I spanked my kids in front of anybody. And and even whenever even when our kids were at home and their friend you know, friends or our friends were there, I didn't spank my kids in front of them ninety nine percent. My goal was not to embarrass my kid, my goal was to teach. My goal wasn't to prove was not to prove that I'm a disciplinarian, my goal was to, to teach. Now I would swat them, you know, in front of people that we knew, like if we were at church and they're out of line, I'd swat them. But I'm talking so so number one, you do have to be wise. I think you can say when we get home, you're going to get a spanking, but you have to follow through with it. it Huh? And, and I think you just can't allow your, your fear of what's going on to erode your trust in God, what God does. In Missouri, it's not illegal to spank. You know, it's, it's if you are, there are some guidelines that are there that, it, that are pretty easy to read if you get online. I haven't read them for four or five years. I did four or five years ago. Janice could give you the specifics and probably somebody else. But again, just being judicious and then also making sure, again, that you're not out of control. Uh, but, you know, I... There have been times, I, you know, and, and again, spanking has been not in vogue for, for years. Uh, Carrie sent me an article several years, which well, might have been years ago, it's been months ago, and it was an article that was contrasting the French, it was French, French wasn't it, and the, and the English kids, I believe, and the number of drugs that are prescribed in France as opposed to the number of drugs that are prescribed for kids in, in the United States. And uh, you remember the study, Carrie? I was going to take... I'm pretty sure it's France, but it was... Was it no, Sweden, France? Pardon me? I think it was France. Which, which you know, uh, the French aren't known for their boldness, at least in, in the typical joking kind of world, I guess. You know, you kind of, you, but, but as, they, as I read this article, and it was, it was in one of, the, the, uh, one of the, the medical journals, literally they have about 1% of their kids, you know, on, on the drugs that we have tons of our kids on that they use them far less when it comes to ADD and, uh, uh, you know, other disorders of that ilk. And, and by the way, now, honestly, and I'm not anti-drug, period. I think we need to be very careful, and I think a lot of times we prescribe drugs so we don't have to do our own thing of disciplining. But there are some long-term things that they're beginning to associate that, you, that, that, you know, that, that can be problematic. But in, as they were describing why in France they didn't have these kids on, on the medications, one of the things that the, the study noted that I didn't know is that spanking was still totally accepted. That they, that they in France, there's a couple things I noticed. They, had, they, they set up rigid structure, that's discipline, and they felt that spanking was not detrimental. And I thought, man, those two things, and you're going, that may explain that. There's, there's benefits to that. Guys, we're, we're out of time with the question and answer. We're going to run through this other one real quick, and sorry about that. Uh, if you have a question, if you want to ask us afterwards, you can, and, and we'll answer that. Uh, did you get the notes handed out yet for those for the next one? Okay, sorry about that, guys. We just, and we'll try just to really soar through this one so we'll be done by five after something like that, okay? And you can skip the, uh, pardon me? Okay. <laughs>